moment. We're sort of sleeping in from our Valentine's Day celebrations. Let's see if the camera is working. Ah, uh, there we go. Good. That looks pretty good. I think we're good. I think that's about as good as it's going to get this morning. Okay, let us begin. At any moment, Jeneline will hopefully join us. Good morning, everybody. This is the what 11th lecture in the If You Really Love Nothing lecture series. Um, we're sort of slowly getting towards the end here. And so it's the penultimate class. This is supposed to be an epic introduction to a lot of Slavoj Zizek's theories and ideas. And along the way, sort of a backtracking through various theological concepts and of course, the theme of nothingness, and hopefully also an introduction to philosophy in general. So if this is the very first time that you are joining us, welcome to our learning community. Uh, about a year ago, if you can believe it, Jeneline and myself, Jeneline who is, I don't know, still getting ready, uh, started teaching these live classes on the internet, on live stream, and the idea is that you can start at any point. So every lecture is standalone, zero knowledge required. However, if you want to watch the other lectures, it's sort of a make your own adventure. So you don't have to start in week one. You can sort of weave your way through the lectures as you see fit. They've been taught in a dialectical fashion, which means that you can basically start at one point and go either direction. Every single idea that we talk about in this lecture series is supposed to be reverberated throughout all the other classes. So the idea is that you don't have to start with the first lecture or the third lecture. If you're starting right here, right now, you are at the perfect spot to begin. There is no ideal starting point. In other words, we're trying to teach a lecture series in which there is no linear progression. And so... The first couple of classes are obsessed with the problem of beginning, and ah, here comes Jenny. <laughs> I love all the snow that snow came into the coming car. In. Oh my gosh, it is so beautiful outside. I almost thought we should sit outside. But no, it's cold. way too cold. It's really cold. Thanks for joining us. Yes, of course. I'm just gonna... Okay, so Jenilene is just about to join us, which means that we can start our Valentine's Day <laughs> class. Yes, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Jenilene has this brought us coffees Inevitable as well. Coffee. Generally not a <laughs> matching camera. Moomin mugs. Yes. There we go. Let's set up the camera so that both of us can be in. Oh, now neither of us are on camera, which works too. That works. Does that's that true. work? Okay. Excellent. Oh, this is my cup? Yeah. Okay. This is my cup. And generally, do you get to show off your cup? This is very 2020 theme. That's the 2020 <laughs> Moomin. Art. It's excellent. Hey, but it's 2021. 2020 is behind us. So, new now, year. Who's going to get to be in frame? How are we yeah. going to do this? Yeah. I realized that usually I sit on the other side. Usually do you want to do a swap? Nope. Are you sure? <laughs> it's just perfect. Yes. Well, for everybody watching on YouTube, I apologize. I'm going to be making <laughs> eye contact over there. I'll make eye contact. But Jenny can look not, at YouTube. You're not so, abandoned. Am yeah. I even can see where the camera is? Okay. That kind of works. Okay. I think we should perfect. just launch right in because it's like, fun. where were you, by the way? That was like 10 coffee. minutes of stalling. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're right. That's I'm okay. sorry. That's so bad. That's okay. I was waiting for the car to get warm. <laughs> you were, yeah, Jelly was waiting for the car to get warm. Exactly. Okay, so so basically the idea, and I actually took a couple of notes today because like we're, we're getting towards the end of this series, so I want to make sure that there's a couple of beats that we hit. I want to play a drinking game with you <laughs> which is every time we manage to slip in a sex in the city reference i feel like we should take like a big sip of coffee or something <laughs> now sex in the city is of course a very outdated television series right now but jenny and i yesterday as part of our valentine's day celebrations <laughs> we watched the sex in the city movie First one, I take it. It was so bad. The Sex in the City movie. <laughs> yes. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> I very, very much enjoyed the Sex in the City movie. And there was like a million sort of ideas that came to my yes. mind. So, so of course, this, this 
class on Marx and Marxism is going to be all about sex Perfect. in the city. If you've never Perfect. watched Sex in the City, good for, for you. you. <laughs> good for you. Um, okay, so first of all, we have to say that Sex in the City, the movie, mm -hmm. uh, there's not really any sex in this. Like, this is how you can really see that we've gone from the television series to the movie. To the mature, yes. To the everyone has to watch it because mm -hmm. there's barely any sex in it. Mm -hmm. And if anything, the universe of the Sex in the City movie mm -hmm. It's very much the post-Sex in the City movie. In other words, it's the neurotic version of Sex in the City. It's the Ann City, which is sort of what we enjoy in our entertainment, is people sitting in restaurants eating together. Well, and it's also, if the, first, <laughs> if the television series is about having sex in the city, mm -hmm. the movie is very much about not having sex in the city. Mm. Right? Like, mm -hmm. everything is about sort of this, like... Breakdown. Uh, yeah, the... Or to put it in Freudian terms, the return of the repressed. <laughs> in other words, is Sex in the City, the movie subtitle should be Sex in the City, the movie, mm -hmm. return of the repressed. <laughs> because everything that's sort of repressed is coming yes. back constantly. Yes. Okay, so I want to start here with the idea of fetishistic disavowal. <laughs> fetishistic disavowal. I don't know if we can... Well, that's fine. Ah, it's fine. Okay. If you're if you want to see Jenling, you can go to our YouTube channel in which Jenling's <laughs> reaction like reaction shots are perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So fetishistic disavowal. disavowal. The classic example that Zizek uses for mm. this. And a lot of the things that we're talking about here, you can find in Zizek's sublime object of ideology. I think it's like mm -hmm. chapter one or something. The classic example within psychoanalysis of fetishistic disavowal is the husband who loses his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't lose her in the forest. Like, mm -hmm. she dies. And he somehow seems pretty okay with this. Like, he doesn't have, like, a really, like, five stages like of grief yeah. or anything like this. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't mm -hmm. cry. He seems pretty much totally capable of dealing with this. So right. the husband who has just lost his wife does not seem to be in any way sort of to be mentally or mm -hmm. psychologically suffering from mm -hmm. this fact. Except that he has a pet hamster who he takes care of. And the pet hamster is like his favorite pet. Like, mm -hmm. And when the hamster suddenly dies, mm -hmm. the man has a full mental breakdown. And this is the idea of fetishistic disavowal, right? Is you take all that libidinal energy, mm -hmm. or in this case, like the suffering. The suffering. And the, you, mm -hmm, the mourning. Yeah. yeah, the mourning. And you mm -hmm. put that into something and then... Once that goes, you've like it's like you've lost the foundation on which your mm -hmm. functioning rested. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, there's myriad other examples of this that we could use. Mm -hmm. um, I came across a really interesting one the other day. Mm -hmm. This was about a forensics expert. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're a forensics expert and you're working in like uh, criminal investigations, mm -hmm. your your job is fairly horrific. For example, like the example was um, they found like a bag of bones belonging to like i don't know two months like one month old infants mm -hmm. and so she has to like sift through all the bones to determine like how old were these babies mm -hmm. when they were strangled or something like mm -hmm. really yeah. really gruesome stuff for torture cases like yeah. just the uh, very yeah, yeah you know part of the reason that i did not become an archaeologist is because most forensic anthropology is like genocidal archaeology mm. and going through like Central America, former Yugoslavia and visiting all these sites and trying to determine what happened. That is very far afield from like digging up bones in Egypt, which is <laughs> a childhood fantasy. But yes. I've, I desperately want to go on a Hegelian riff about how the secrets of the Egyptians were secrets yes. to the Egyptians themselves, but I'm not going to do it. Because <laughs> I, we are focused on really sex and here. Yeah. <laughs> We have a riff. Yeah. So you're, yeah, you're right. So a lot of uh, forensics yeah. is sort of inherently grim mm -hmm. and quite traumatic because mm -hmm. you're dealing with the remnants of people who have not died in ordinary circumstances. And so what's kind of interesting is you ask yourself, does a forensic uh, analyst expert mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have a way of coping with this? Right. And there's this infamous story about one of the most like famous forensic experts who like nothing would make this guy squeamish yeah, squeamish like, like he could go, he could go to as you said genocidal mm. grave sites mm. or look at photographs of tortured mutilated bodies sift through the bones of children whatnot and then he had an, an enormous mental breakdown when what was what it was triggered by mm. was the sound 
of ice cubes breaking in his glass. <laughs> One day he went to like the ice cube dispenser yeah. and the ice cubes came out and they make that sound of like breaking glass <laughs> and something like in his mind just broke. And that's fetishistic disavowal, right? Is you've gone through this traumatic circumstance, mm -hmm. but you've sort of coped. And then there's this one thing that like shatters that, that break. Your ability to cope with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, return of the repressed in a <laughs> sense, right? So what's important here is whether it's the hamster, right? Mm -hmm. The husband's, uh, the, the widower's hamster that dies, whether it's the ice cube that triggers the psychological mm -hmm. breakdown, there's nothing particularly meaningful mm -hmm. about the dis the object of disavowal itself. Right. Like it doesn't matter that it's a hamster. Mm -hmm. There's no, like it could be like a tortoise. It yeah. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that it's ice cubes. It could be, I don't know, like sipping on a straw or something like mm -hmm. the, the object that becomes imbued with that repressed energy mm -hmm. is inherently meaningless. Right. It's just simply the, the vessel of that repression. So is that what sort of makes it a fetish is that it's an object into which meaning has been put that is not necessarily related to the meaning of the object itself? Uh, yes. Okay. So we'll get to that. But okay. basically what it means is that it's a fetish because you've created a stand-in for a perceived loss. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. You created a stand-in <laughs> for a perceived loss. Yeah. Um, and we'll get back to them because we'll talk about foot fetishes more. <laughs> and of course, Sex and City has a lot of fetishes. It's important to remember briefly here that like for Marx, Mar uh, not Marx, for Freud, the theory of the foot fetish mm. was, and it's very often misunderstood, and I'll explain later why. The theory of the foot fetish was that the young boy, mm -hmm. prepubescent boy, expects the mother to have a phallus. Or a penis, like a right. like a literal pe penis, uh -huh. and the shock of there being no penis where he expects to be one uh -huh. means that he then expects the penis to be somewhere else. Uh -huh. In other words, feet, for example. But okay, okay. we're gonna get back to the problems <laughs> of that theory because yes. there's problems with that theory. Okay, so we have fetishistic disavowal, right? Is you've taken mm -hmm. that energy and you've sort of repressed it, right. and and then there's a return of the repressed. There's this breakdown uh -huh. in a sense. Um. And so it doesn't matter, like I said before, whether it's a hamster or ice cubes, mm -hmm. like the object in which the fetish and the disavowal becomes imbued is in a sense meaningless in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And that is the fundamental point that you have to remember for Freudian dream analysis. Right. Uh, we kind of talked about this in the TikTok the other day, because mm -hmm. for Freud, one of the things that Freud was confronted with all the time was a criticism that he already knew people would say what does it mean for there to be something in your dream mm -hmm. and if that something reveals something ordinary why is it even important for example let's say that you know you fall over you have a dream in which you're like afraid of flying and then you say i'm afraid afraid of flying like that doesn't seem particularly mm -hmm. profound mm -hmm. and so freud said the manifest dream content the thing that i dream about is relatively arbitrary mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it's going to be repressed into something. Like, the thing that I'm repressing during the day will manifest mm -hmm. into an object in the dream. Mm -hmm. That's not particularly profound in and of itself. Right? And so the Freudian dream analysis always requires two steps. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of like mirroring each other. Mm -hmm. The first step of Freudian dream analysis is to take the dream too seriously. <laughs> and anybody who's, like, told you their dream you know what that's like, right? It's like they've taken the dream very literally. Yes. And so the first thing that Freud does, which is hard to... Because it feels so real, but it's really hard to convey that to someone else. It's really hard to convince someone else that your dream is meaningful and interesting and important because as soon as you start talking about it, you feel like it's yeah, just a weird thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And that's, in a sense, like Freud's innovation here already, mm -hmm. which he says the first step of dream analysis is to take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. So we have to take, because until then, like, I mean, of course there was like readings of dreams, etc. But right. the idea is dreams are relatively mm -hmm. meaningless, especially in like a Victorian era. You just sort of shrug off, 
your mm-hmm. your uh, what happens like in your dream state as right. being you know not mm-hmm. worthy of mm-hmm. consideration. Mm-hmm. And so the first step in dream analysis is you take your dreams very seriously. In fact, you take them too seriously. And then the second step of dream analysis, and here we have like to be a little bit like fancy about it, almost negation of negation. Mm-hmm. The second step is that we demystify the dream. Mm-hmm. So we start by saying the content is extremely important. I want to know exactly what it is that you dreamt about. Mm -hmm. And then the second and crucial step is to say, I'm not interested in what you dreamt about. I'm interested in the underlying structure Mm -hmm. of how something became repressed into that structure. Mm -hmm. And if you only do one of those steps, you end up with sort of Freud's, you know, nemesis. You end up with a Jungian (laughs) dream analysis. These sort of, I'm going to give you a chart of what the dreams mean. Can, you I, okay? can I turn this off? You turning so the engine off? Warm. You warm? Okay, yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, we're turning the car engine off as of now. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. How am I going to power myself? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go on a little riff here for a moment, if you're still with <laughs> us. YouTube, Instagram. We're actually not live streaming to TikTok this morning because we don't have a third device. So if you're on TikTok, you're missing out this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, little riff here. Keep in mm-hmm. mind, like the so the point of the Freudian dream analysis here is we're interested in the way in which the structure of the repressed becomes folded back into the dream itself. Mm. Um, I can give you a little example of this. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to talk too much about my dreams, right? But the other day, I had a dream mm-hmm. in which I had a romantic encounter with mm-hmm. someone who is not you. Oh! But it wasn't like anything <laughs> like big. It was just like there is another person. Mm-hmm. I don't even know who it was. Probably like mm-hmm. a celebrity or something. <laughs> and that person said, "Aren't you with somebody else?" Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, "Of course I'm with somebody else." <laughs> and then I realized I can't remember who that person is <laughs> because I was thinking of the wrong somebody else. In other words, I was Whoa. thinking I was thinking about someone who was not you. I was thinking about a previous relationship. <laughs> Okay, so uncomfortable, I know, <laughs> but the point here is like a Freudian dream analysis was, would say mm. it's meaningless who that other person is in the dream. Right. And it's not even about you. It's mm-hmm. not even about my wife. Mm-hmm. It's about the fact, and it's not even about the fact that I can't remember that other person. Right. It's about the fact that my marriage mm-hmm. relationship is so quote unquote successful <laughs> That I don't remember my previous relationship. Hmm. And there's a part of me Mm -hmm. that says, wait, why don't you remember that? Hmm. And so the structure of the dream Mm -hmm. is about misremembering. And it's not about remembering. So it's not about saying, I wish I were with that person. Right, right. It's trying to reconstruct a story. Because I think dreams are often about trying to make sense of something that's happened to you or that you can't understand or, like you say, that you can't remember. And so, mm-hmm. I made you sound comfortable. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. The reason I'm pointing this out is that one of the definitions for the unconscious, mm-hmm. the Freudian unconscious and not mm-hmm. the subconscious, the Freudian unconscious is its thought thinking itself. Mm-hmm. So it's the part of thought that I'm not in control of. It's the thought that thinks itself. And a thought can only think itself if it's thinking its own structure. Mm-hmm. And think about sleep. That's sort of what sleep is right. like. Like, you're not really dreaming of something. Right. You're dreaming the structure of dreaming itself. Mm-hmm. That's part of dreaming. Okay. Are we ready for a riff? Yes. Briefly? Yeah? Yeah. Well, it'll get back to Sex in the City. Of <laughs> I was reading something really interesting about... I wish we could both be in frame. I'm sorry. I just didn't have time to set it up properly. This That's is like my narcissistic mirroring... Mm-hmm. Okay, you're here. On YouTube, you could see Jenlene's <laughs> reaction shots in their full glory. Uh, also, thank you to Jenlene for being here. For those of you who've never joined the class, Jenlene performs the role of interlocutor, yes. which means that she makes it easier for me to talk to myself, <laughs> yes. which is like a supremely <laughs> like autoerotic supplementary function. But thank you. No, I'm I'm here for the coffee. You're here for the coffee. <laughs> no. Okay, so I <laughs> I read an article about the Catholic Church that I thought mm. was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And it was basically about homosexuality in the Catholic Church. And one of the sort of open secrets, as it were, because mm-hmm. 
you know, the Catholic Church is all about open secrets. In fact, <laughs> yes. the entire faith is an open secret, as it were. Um, one of the open secrets is that Vatican City has many, many homosexuals who live in Vatican City, mm -hmm. and that the Catholic Church has many homosexuals who are priests, none of which is, of course, surprising. Mm -hmm. What is more surprising mm -hmm. is if this is the case, that the Catholic Church has many homosexual members mm -hmm. who are, in a sense, you could say, repressed mm -hmm. because they're not openly gay. Mm -hmm. Why then, if you have up to 50% of gays in the church, I hope I'm using the right terminology. If I'm causing offense, I apologize. Why then wouldn't you simply reform the church? Mm -hmm. Now, the traditional, let's say, you know, common sense argument here is to say the church is evil and oppressive and you know if we could only have laws church if only, rules if only we had more acceptance more acceptance could be more functional yeah the church could be more functional etc mm -hmm. that's one take mm -hmm. the other take is to say it's dangerous to have repression in the church mm -hmm. because if if everybody's blackmailing each other then you know, then you have, end up with with uh, pedophilia cases, mm -hmm. people protecting each other, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are the two common sense arguments. But this article, I think, it was in the London Review of Books, made a really, really fascinating point, which is the people who benefit from the closetedness of Vatican City mm -hmm. are the gay priests themselves, mm -hmm. because the entire power structure of Vatican City is based on this idea. That you're constantly playing hide and seek. Mm. And if everything were in the open, the power of those men would actually disappear. Mm -hmm. In other words, the repressedness, the repressed element of their homosexuality. So you're saying rather than being harmful for those priests, actually protects their power structure. Oh, no, no, no. It's completely harmful to them. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's not harmful. Okay. But the power structures mm -hmm. are so entwined with the closetedness mm. that to get rid of the prohibition against homosexuality mm -hmm. would upend the order so much that the homosexual priests would lose their power. And so what happens is that as a general rule of thumb, homosexual priests can be identified by being the most radically hmm. homophobic. <laughs> you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, Many, and I'm generalizing here based on what I've read, I just find the principle interesting. So many gay priests within Vatican City actually protect and uphold the repressive structure because they're power players within it. Mm -hmm. And their own emancipation would not equal more power for them. Right. And the, the structure of repression, in a sense, becomes... Self-reinforcing. Yeah. yeah. And so... In a lot of lectures, I mentioned here a television series that Jenny and I both very much enjoyed mm -hmm. called The Young Pope. Yeah, because it's not all sex in the city. Uh, the, uh, yeah, <laughs> Se sex in Vatican City. <laughs> Thanks for setting up that joke. Yeah, sex in the city and sex in Vatican City. I'm glad you took a cup of sip of your coffee. And so the in The Young Pope, you can sit next to you, so I know, I was trying to not break the line of sight with, with both, but I think it's okay. Thanks. In The Young Pope... There's a scene in which the new pope, played mm -hmm. by Jude Law, uh, basically starts saying we have to forbid homosexuality proper. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're going to expel homosexual priests from Vatican City. Mm -hmm. And what happens immediately is that the um, – so he has a spy, and the spy is the person who takes confessions from the priest. Right. And, of course – the confessions, so there's rumors that gays will be excluded from Vatican City. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly all the gay priests are going into the confession, giving detailed heterosexual sins, right? They want to signal I'm not homosexual. Mm -hmm. So they go and they confess in great detail <laughs> all of the heterosexual transgressions they've made against the church. And he's like, ah, so suddenly, because we're thinking about banning homosexuals, mm -hmm. suddenly everybody is performing heterosexual sin. Right. And so what I want to point out here is obviously I and Jen Lee and I both are, are and this goes without saying, <laughs> advocates of emancipation. But it's also interesting how these structures of repression mm -hmm. return, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the reason that I'm bringing this up here is that 
we cannot say that repression simply has to be taken away altogether. Right. If we eradicate repression, we will receive emancipation. That's yes. not that's yeah. not true. It doesn't work that way, right? Right. You don't take yeah. like so what's important here is the relationship between repression mm. and the symptom. Mm, that's a good way to put right? it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so in order to understand that is think about Marx's utopia for a moment here, right? Mm -hmm. Utopia for Marx. Here's what utopia is. Mm -hmm. A closed system that does not generate its own exception. Right. A closed harmonious system that does not have a symptom. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it utopian. Because for Marx, every system creates its own exclusion, creates its own particular, creates its own exception. Mm -hmm. In other words, Marx himself and Marxism itself is the particular exclusion that comes naturally within the capitalist order. Right. Capitalism creates its own internal limit, mm -hmm. which we call Marxism. And so according to Marx's own theory, if it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. Yeah. And more than that, that's why for Marx, it's not enough to just be a critic of capitalism. He basically says anyone can criticize capitalism because its flaws are so obvious and so apparent. Yeah, yeah no. And this is, this is what makes people uncomfortable about mm -hmm. the difference between volume one of capital and volume two, mm -hmm. because volume one is a sort of a literary masterpiece. <laughs> like it's very polite. <coughs> Excuse me. You okay. It's very polemical. He's using mm -hmm. quotes and illustrations <laughs> and metaphors from across the literary spectrum and antiquity. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's a polemic in a, in a way. And then, in volume two, Marx does the, I'm going to write something totally bone dry, mm -hmm. which is going to be my obsession with use value and commodity value and creating formulas for it, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. In other words, Marx really falls in love with capitalism and wants to sort of map out what he thinks a political economy should be. You were going to say? Well, he, he understands that the only way to, to, to critique it is to, um, it's really gross, but sort of crawl inside its skin and start moving it around and demonstrate the ways in which it is problematic. And that's why he's so influenced by like English political economists is he has to say, okay, well, let's take these ideas seriously and what happens when you start manipulating them and recognize their limitations. Yeah. yeah. When he hates a lot of those, like Adam yeah, Smith yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah. Am I so the reason, thank you very much, Shanlene. And Everybody, we need to send like tons and tons of messages to Jeline to say, please do a political economy class. <laughs> Jeline is a political economist. I'm just bluffing when I talk about economics. If I talk about money, I am bluffing. So so thank you for sending encouragement Jeline's yeah. way because we want to have a Jeline political economy class. Okay, I've put enough. One thing at a time. I've exploited <laughs> this situation enough. <laughs> okay, so let's talk briefly about the commodity fetish for a moment, mm, right? Yes. I, and, and we'll get back to all the other ideas. Remember, mm -hmm. this is one of those classes where hopefully every idea will lead back to the others mm -hmm. if you stick with us. <laughs> so one of the, uh, let's say, misattributed ideas or misconceptions about the commodity fetish mm -hmm. is that it's simply that you treat objects as if they were people. Yes. So uh, if you do that literally, we find ourselves in the universe of... Tom Hanks and his volleyball. Wilson. Wilson. <laughs> in, uh, I don't know, Castaway or something, a film in which uh, we have like a Crusoe type character, mm -hmm. Tom Hanks, who speaks to his volleyball and puts mm -hmm. a smiley on it. And it's <laughs> Wilson, right? Do a whole Wilson thing. Uh, that is not how the commodity fetish works. Right. And a much better way to understand the commodity fetish is to look at Sex in the City. <laughs> Now, there's a scene in the Sex in the City movie mm -hmm. that I really enjoyed yesterday. Mm. And it has to do with the character of Samantha. Samantha being the uh, most hedonistic of the <laughs> four female protagonists. Mm -hmm. And um, she is someone... I don't want to do all backstory. You either know Samantha or you don't know Samantha. Okay, <laughs> we're talking about yeah. Sex in the City. And so there's... She basically breaks up. Spoilers for Sex and the City, the movie from 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd say that. Um, she's basically, she's torn. She has a ring, mm -hmm. one of those big fancy diamond rings. And this ring was gifted to her by her lover. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, she confesses to herself and to him. She says, when I look at this ring, I see you. But what I want to do when I look at this ring 
is I want to see me. She says she, she wanted to buy it for herself. Yes. And he knew that she really wanted it. And so he bought it for her. And so she felt like all the enjoyment of having it was taken away from this object because it signified something that she didn't want it to signify. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You, you put that much better than I did, which is that the ring was supposed to be a social sign of her relation with herself. In other words, the, yes, or independence or like in terms, autoeroticism. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. the, the <laughs> ring was supposed to be a vessel of Samantha's love for Samantha. Mm -hmm. Instead, the ring becomes a symbol of his love for Samantha. Yeah. And so, and she's, she's, She's correct to be aware of the tension here. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways in which we can understand the commodity fetish. Mm -hmm. We start treating the relation between objects as if it were the relationship between people. So the relationship between things takes on the relationship between objects. Mm -hmm. Again, the commodity itself is relatively meaningless. Mm -hmm. We're back in the, uh, what is it, the disavowal of the fetishism fetishistic mm -hmm. disavowal right mm -hmm. doesn't matter it doesn't matter if it's a hamster it doesn't matter, <laughs> matter if it's an ice cube what matters is the relation between things right and so the ring can signify two relations the relation between he loves me and he buys me the ring mm -hmm. or i love myself and i buy me the ring <laughs> and of course spoilers for sex in the city samantha <laughs> eventually says I need to love myself mm -hmm. more than I need you to love me. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, like in our today's politically correct age, mm -hmm. that almost mm -hmm. makes sense because it's this whole, you have to learn how to love yourself in order <laughs> to love someone else. Yes. And Samantha kind of twists it on his head and she says, I need to not love you because <laughs> I need to love me. You know what I mean? So there's just kind of that. Um, so while we're on the theme of commodity fetish and, uh, let's say forensics, right? Mm -hmm. If you're just joining, we're talking about forensics and forensic analysis of bones, etc. Mm -hmm. One of Hegel's famous aphorisms that links up to Marx and what we're talking about is the idea, of, and I mentioned this last week, that the spirit is the bone. Mm -hmm. Spirit equals bone. And it's about subject-object relationship and how they're not opposites, but they're mediated into each other. Blah, blah, blah. We're not going to do a whole Hegel. We did a lot of Hegel. We did like three three weeks of Hegel at least. Okay. But <clears throat> what I realized reading about forensics is that actually we have a perfect contemporary scientific example of spirit as bone. Mm. In a way that Hegel would never even have known. Apparently, severe stress or trauma mm. can actually be read on bone structure hmm. in the same way that like, for example, if you look at the rings of trees, we can see like when a tsunami hit an mm -hmm. Island is because all the rings are like impacted on mm -hmm. those trees. Mm -hmm. Like we can, mm -hmm. we can sort of tell time. Mm -hmm. And apparently there can be really high stress, emotional stress, not physical stress that can impact the physical body. And the reason that they found this out was that when they were looking at the bone structure of victims of childhood sexual abuse hmm. they could actually date the instances of That's sexual so abuse when like i don't know uncle so-and-so would come to visit jelly's like this got so really dark so like a valentine's dark. episode has gotten really dark sorry <laughs> they could basically like find that like written into people's written in bone. bone that there would be mm -hmm. like the calcium layering would mm -hmm. be different in a sense <clears throat> which i think is sort of sort of fascinating mm -hmm. right like that's very much the spirit is bone like the well farmers will talk about how like for lamb if they're if they're particularly stressed mm -hmm. their wool is is much like it's a lot kinkier it's a lot um it's a lot more textured it's not as smooth so really good quality wool is usually come from very relaxed lambs evidently i like that that's pretty good <laughs> is there something about like the milk also <clears throat> Maybe. Like if you massage a cow's teats or something, the milk's sweeter. <laughs> no, no, no. That's like part of why they like part of the whole like milking a cow. Hmm, like, maybe. Yeah, yeah, because anyway, let's just anyway. hold another riff. <laughs> hold another riff. Um as it were. Okay, so thank you if you're still with us. Gonna slow down a little bit. Uh let's briefly go back to sex and <coughs> You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know it's cold. <laughs> Sex and the City. Sex and the City and Marx. So 
or no sex in the city, right? Because we yes. already we already established that the Sex in the City movie should have the subtitle The Return of the Repressed. Because in a sense, everything is coming back to haunt them. Like mm -hmm. nothing is really working out. And the one thing that they're not having is sex mm -hmm. for pretty much, I mean, some of the care, whatever. And so there's many, many fetish objects in Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. But of course, one fetishistic object trumps all the others, at least for the main character of Carrie Bradshaw. And this is, you can probably guess. Shoes. Shoes, exactly. Shoes, right? <laughs> Shoes are like the main object of fetish mm -hmm. in, in Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. And so much so that you could say, now let me build it up like this. Okay, there's two things. There's a shoe, mm -hmm. right? Shoes are highly desired. Yeah. What is the other thing that is highly desired by the protagonist, Carrie Bradshaw? Good real estate. Yeah, yeah, that too. That too. Fair enough. Yeah. Places where you can put shoes. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's still in the category of shoes. Shoes and what is the what is the physical love interest here? Big. Big, exactly. A man who's not called big. A man who's called Joe or something, John. John. And he's <laughs> John. And he's referred to as Big. Also, how is this not a reference to the Lacanian Big Other? Yes. And the fact that over approximation to the Big Other creates hysterical conversion, like hello. <laughs> like, okay, that's psychoanalytic reading. So we have here two obsessions in a sense, right? Uh, yeah. with with great libidinal investment. Mm -hmm. Shoes and big. Right. And what the Big as in like the man of her dreams, the man that she's always in like a on and off relationship with, you know, they break up more times than you can count. Uh, the the Dutch actually have a word for this kind of relationship. They call it a knipper licht relatie. And a knipper licht relatie uh, means a blinking light relationship. Yeah. Like it's like on and flashing off, light. flashing yeah, light, like, like on and off, on <laughs> off. Nothing to do with the red light district. And okay, so. And if you take shoes, my hands are really cold. If you take shoes and big, mm -hmm. the two basically bounce back and forth. Mm -hmm. In other words, shoes and big can't both be satisfied. Mm. So sort of a one or the other. It's sort of a one or the other, mm. at least to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And and I, I'm not going to do like a whole analysis of Sex City, but in the 1960s, mm. when there were student protests in Paris. Mm -hmm. Jacques Lacan, who is apparently a favorite of TikTok, who knew? <laughs> uh, Lacan infamously said, you are simply looking for a new master, mm -hmm. right? You're looking for a new master. And this mm -hmm. was this was conceived understandably and rightfully as a rebuke of the protests. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but this has to do very much with Lacan's take on, take on Marx, mm -hmm. with the idea that you cannot have a utopia. You can't have a system that doesn't generate its own exception. Right. And, and so Lacan is saying you're simply throwing away one master mm -hmm. and you're going to be looking for another master. Um, in other words, there's like a hysteria of conversion here, right? It's like you're saying, we don't want this master, we want that master. Mm -hmm. This is very much like a Kantian uh, attitude mm -hmm. because Kant, I think we talked about this last week, Kant had this idea about uh, humans are the only types of beings who not only want a master, but they want to choose their own master. Right? They want a qualified master. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a teacher. I'm looking mm -hmm. for a guru. I'm mm -hmm. looking for a partner who can be my master. I'm looking for a religion that can be my master. Like Humans are constantly looking for the master figure, mm -hmm. but they want to be able to choose which one is the appropriate one. Yeah. As it were. Well, that's why the paradox in like spiritual choosing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's the paradox? Well, this idea that you both inherit your spiritual home, in a sense, from your family and community, but you also choose it to the degree that you might say, well, I don't like this priest for that priest, or I don't like oh, yeah. the sermon from this person, but I want sermon from that person, or this teaching, or that teaching. Yeah. Very true. Okay. Yes. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, and, of course, what we see in the Sex and the City movie mm -hmm. is that Carrie Bradshaw is a woman in search of a master. And this sounds incredibly sexist, but that's not my intention here. My intention is that Carrie Bradshaw has made different things the master figure in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, it was shoes. Mm -hmm. 
and then it was love. Mm -hmm. Those were the two main themes of the Sex and the City series. In fact, consistently, love and shoes are brought into like uh, like a mirrored relationship. Mm -hmm. She likes. Mm -hmm. There's lines like. Uh, the only style that never goes out of fashion is love, uh -huh. or the only label that can't be thrown away is love, yeah. and the only thing women really love is shoes. Like there's this constant like collapse between shoes and love. In like a sense. like her version, her like Freudian twist would be everything is about shoes except shoes, which are about love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Everything is about shoes except shoes, which are something else. <laughs> That's very true. And so. There's a, there's a, we're doing like the, how many times can we quote Sex in the City here? Because <laughs> Jenny and I watched Sex in the City last night as part of our Valentine's Day masochistic ritual. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, there's a line where um, she's talking about Big, mm -hmm. this romantic relationship, mm -hmm. the person who she is going to marry, mm -hmm. or she thinks she's going to marry. Yeah. And, uh, she basically says that she refers to him as a man friend. And the response to that is that referring to your husband, your spouse to be as a man friend makes him sound like a dog, right? <laughs> makes him sound like a dog. Yeah. And her response to that, well, this makes me sound like a dog is, well, if the shoe fits. <laughs> and this is perfect. Like, I really like the writing here because we have this problem of finding the authentic master figure. Mm -hmm. We we suggested that master shoe mm -hmm. was being rejected yes. in lieu of master husband. Yes. But now <laughs> we have again like the collapse of that mm -hmm. where suddenly the husband is supposed to be submissive to me. Right. As a dog, mm -hmm. and we say if the shoe fits. In mm -hmm. other words, if the shoe fits mm -hmm. means you're submissive to me. Right. And so shoe has become this like Hitchcockian <laughs> object, like this mm -hmm. fetish object around which everything <laughs> is revolving. Yeah. And of course, in keeping with this shoe theme, mm -hmm. um, Carrie Bradshaw does not want a diamond ring. Mm -hmm. And she tells her husband to be. What I want is a closet that I can fill up with shoes, right? <laughs> this sort of this space. And and the final scene, now we'll come to the final scene later. You have to stick with us for a moment. <laughs> okay. I want to go back to the foot fetish okay. just briefly because all of this does link up. Foot fetish. Mm -hmm. um, remember I said that Freud's definition of the foot fetish is, is confusing and a bit bizarre, mm -hmm. which is he says... When the young male, the prepubescent male, encounters the fact, is confronted with the fact that his mother does not have a penis, mm -hmm. um, that this lack of penis is so traumatic that, and that he simply thinks penis has to be somewhere else, right? And so he looks towards penis could be foot, <laughs> penis could be big to big toe. Um, <laughs> There's a couple of problems here. But first of all, if anyone is generally just like cracking up here, I love it. Sorry. It's great. I'm I'm I, you're right to laugh at this because like there's there's a misrepresentation that I'm making here mm -hmm. that we're gonna understand in a moment. Okay. Um if you've ever read the Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, mm -hmm. I guess Dragon Ball a manga series or mm -hmm. anime series. This is actually something that is like a repeating theme in the first couple of comics hmm. because we have young, I don't know the name of the character. It's like young Goku or Gohan or something like, <laughs> it's like a childlike mm -hmm. character with superhuman powers. Mm -hmm. And one of his obsessions is that he has like a little wiener because mm -hmm. he's a little boy. Yeah. And the female companion does not have one. And because this is a Japanese is this comic, really a plot point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and because this is a Japanese comic for children, <laughs> when she goes to sleep, he will actually go to her and look, and he's like totally horrified that she doesn't like. It's like this total like Freudo Japanese messed up children's comic thing. Like you can honestly find this. It's like what like one of the recurring. Uh, comic gags mm -hmm. of the original Dragon Ball series is young, whatever his name is, Goku, Gohan, something, discovering that his female companion does not have a penis. This is not a sexual scene, though. Like, it's yeah, not yeah. meant as, like, because the Japanese comics are extremely... Yeah, okay, someone just said Goku and Bulma. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Chocolate milk knows everything. Like, that's <laughs> always true. So, um, 
when these comics are meant to be sexualized, mm-hmm. they're totally sexualized. Like they're not hiding anything. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. there's an older character who, like, if he sees a woman and she's like partially unclothed, like he spurts blood out of his nose. Like he's so aroused, it's mm-hmm. like a short circuit. Mm-hmm. So this is not even in the realm of sexuality. Like mm-hmm. this is pure the encounter of I think there should be something where there is not something, right? As well. Mm-hmm. And this is also how we have to see the Freud thing mm-hmm. because it's not even about oh, you don't have a penis, so you must have an appendage somewhere that is a penis. Mm -hmm. It's very much about the breaking of a certain tautology. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mirror myself to the world, Mm -hmm. and I have something, and I perceive that thing as not being there somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's that that breakdown, as it were, right? And so to go back to our original argument, Mm -hmm. it's very much about it doesn't matter if it's the hamster. It doesn't matter if it's the ice cubes. Or the ring. Yeah, in the ring. In mm-hmm. the same way, it doesn't matter whether it's the foot. Mm-hmm. The point of a foot fetish is not that the foot is like a phallus. Mm-hmm. And this is the problem with all these like pop psychology articles that you'll read in like newspapers and stuff with like, what is it about feet that people find arousing? Could it be the shape? Or could it be <laughs> if you stick this part in that part? Like it's all this like extremely vulgar stuff. And that mm-hmm. that's a much dirtier mind. Mm-hmm. There is no meaning in the foot Mm -hmm. as such. The point of a foot fetish is not that the foot is sexual. Mm -hmm. It's that the foot is sexualized. In other words, there's the repression of a perceived loss. Mm -hmm. My wife has died, so now I have a hamster. (laughs) Yeah. I've gone through the traumatic bones of children Mm -hmm. as a forensics Mm -hmm. expert, and suddenly Mm -hmm. Ice Cube triggers me. Mm -hmm. And for Freud, that's analogous to the castration complex. Right. I see something that has no phallus, no penis, and I can't deal with that information. Mm -hmm. And so I put that energy, Mm -hmm. that knowledge into the foot, Mm -hmm. but the foot doesn't matter. Like the foot isn't It's just a foot. It's just a foot. Exactly. It's just a foot. Okay. And so if you find feet to be, sorry for the shrift. If you find feet to be genuinely sexually attractive, Mm -hmm. As in, like, you like doing things with them. Strictly speaking, that's no longer a foot fetish in the way that Freud has it in mind. Hmm. Okay. All right. So we're still talking about fetish here. I feel like there's a really important correction to Sex in the City, which, in fact, has an episode about foot fetishes. Oh, let's hear it, because I don't know this. No, it's it's one of the characters who goes to buy shoes and... uh, uh-huh. She realizes that the salesman only has a job selling shoes because he loves mm. feeling women's feet and he gives her a pair of shoes and she feels morally conflicted because she really likes having free shoes, but she also feels really creeped out by this guy who's like caressing her feet. Ah, oh, well, first of all, that's very impressive. <laughs> uh, Sex in the City knowledge of lore. Sex in the City lore. Uh, and, and, and secondly, right, we have here the same problem that Samantha has. Mm-hmm. Here's a ring. Yeah. And this ring, commodity fetish, mm-hmm. could mean I enjoy myself. Yes. In other words, I bought this ring for myself. Mm-hmm. I enjoy my relation with myself. Mm-hmm. Or the ring could mean I enjoy being loved by somebody else. Yeah. And I don't want that. Right? She doesn't want to be given the ring. She wants to buy her own ring. The same is true with the shoes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Carrie Bradshaw wants the shoe for her own autoerotic enjoyment. Right. But if she wears it for somebody else's enjoyment, she Mm -hmm. is the vessel of that enjoyment. Well, and this all goes back to this notion of what is emancipation and how is it different from freeing yourself from your symptoms versus genuine emancipation. And that's, I mean, that's the thing that Sex and the City always hints at and never engages with is this notion that there's a woman somehow writing newspaper sex columns and earning enough money to somehow be this consumerist in New York City with no material support. Like, that is the fantasy. Yeah. Where Sex in the City really works with the commodity Mm -hmm. fetish, Mm -hmm. and I think you put that very well, is that shoes by themselves are not the fetish of the film. In other words, the movie actually doesn't spend a lot of time filming shoes or doing close-ups of shoes. Mm -hmm. We don't really have an in-depth discussion of what a shoe is. Mm -hmm. The shoes are a means of demonstrating social relations. So, for example, when she wants to show her affection for her assistant, she gives her shoes. When we want to know... Well, she gives her a handbag, but yes. Oh, is it a handbag? Okay, sorry. 
handbag and shoes, same thing for me. But yes, okay. Um, when the assistant, when we need to know that the assistant is not wealthy, we know it because she talks about not being able to have shoes, mm -hmm. etc., or handbags mm -hmm. or whatever. Like so, this, and this is where we are with Marx again about the commodity fetish. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why, if you read the email that we sent out. I was using an idea from Zizek, which is Zizek says, and he's taking this from Lacan because everything Zizek yeah. does is taken from Lacan, is the idea that Marx invented the symptom. Mm. Because what we've been doing all this time is we're not just talking about fetish. We're talking about symptom. Right. Because a symptom is like the thought that thinks itself. It's like the thing that you can't... I'm not explaining this very well. A symptom is that that thing that is the exception to the whole right. that completes it. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, <laughs> if you want to take it literally, a symptom of having the flu is a fever. Mm -hmm. Now, the fever is actually the very thing that is trying to fight the flu. Mm -hmm. So fever is not part of the flu. Mm -hmm. Fever is the part that is trying to undermine the flu. Right. It's symptomatic. In mm -hmm. the same way for Marx, the proletariat is symptomatic of capitalism because it's the internal limit that is trying to fight the thing from which mm -hmm. it comes. Mm -hmm. It's the species in the genus and like a alien term. Right. Um, does that make, does yeah, that yeah, make yeah. sense? Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, so we're actually talking about symptom here. And, and Lacan essentially says it wasn't Freud who invented the symptom. It was Marx who invented the symptom in mm -hmm. the same way that I just expressed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And specifically, he says, the symptom was invented when Marx talked about the transition from a feudal society, from feudalism to capitalism. Now, what happens here in a very Lacanian sense, remember when Lacan in the 1960s said to the revolting protesting students, not they weren't revolting, sorry. <laughs> That's a great phrase. Like, <laughs> the revolting students. <laughs> to Lacan, they were revolting. <laughs> And he basically said, uh, you're looking for a new master. Mm -hmm. And that's the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because in feudalism, the relations of domination are mm -hmm. very clear. Yeah. You have a lord and a bondsman mm -hmm. or whatever, right? You have that You have that clear hierarchical structure of oppression. Or even in slavery. It's totally obvious. It's on the surface. Yeah. Slavery is an even better example. Mm -hmm. And when you go then to a bourgeois society... Right. You still have repression, right. except it is no longer formalized in the way it is formalized in a feudal society. In other words, the power relation, the hierarchy, the oppression mm -hmm. is what is repressed. Right. And what is repressed, remember, dear friends, we talked about the return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. That which is repressed, right. which is the oppression mm -hmm. of capitalism mm -hmm. has to come out right. in the symptomatic expression of capitalism, which is what Marxism describes. Right. So here we have the return of the repressed mm -hmm. as the repression of mm -hmm. oppression right. manifesting itself in the symptom, mm -hmm. which is that which fights the system. Yeah. And one of the most obvious or contains ways, the truth. Yeah. yeah and sorry. I think one mm -hmm. of the most obvious ways you see that <clears throat> for contemporary capitalism is with the discussion of freedom you know, mm. you're free to go work at your job. You're free to, yeah. you know, have your choice of employer, employer. You're free to go out and apply for this. You're free to sell your labor, essentially. Yeah. But Marx's point is that that is not actually a freedom. And capitalism has to create a narrative that embraces that freedom and projects that freedom out in order to create a fix. Yeah, you're exactly right. Like that's exactly a hundred percent where I was going. Mm -hmm. Right. Because Marx then basically says that mm -hmm. when you sell your labor, what the bourgeois society does is it has created a freedom that consists only of the undermining of your freedom. Right. And <laughs> it's, it's a freedom with no choice. Yes. Exactly. And it tells you to make matters worse, that that is the ultimate freedom. Yes. That the, the condition for being a free emancipated subject in society mm -hmm. is to do that which makes you unfree. And you're lucky to be free. Yeah. And, <laughs> you and that, should be grateful for your freedom. <laughs> and that's the perverse part of it is like if you're like in a feudal society, yeah, you're totally oppressed, <laughs> but you don't owe it to your Lord to pretend <laughs> like you're actually being liberated. Yes. That's uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is the... Monty Python and the Holy Grail works exactly like this. Mm -hmm. The king 
goes into his, I don't know what it is, his land, his, <laughs> yes. his whatever, his rule. His and fiefdom. His fiefdom. <laughs> and he is confronted by the fact that no one has to enjoy being oppressed by him. And, and worse yet, no one really knows who he is. <laughs> because, and this is the opposite of a court, right? Because in a court, everyone is relatively free, mm -hmm. but they have to pretend like they're subservient to the king. Right. And then he goes out into the world. <laughs> Nobody is free, but no one's going to pretend like they're subservient to him mm -hmm, as mm -hmm, such. That's mm -hmm. like the traumatic encounter. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, and it's really fascinating to see that tension in societies that are sort of on the cusp between them. Mm -hmm. And um, you see that especially in the American South during an era where capitalism and slavery were sort of coexistent, was there was this notion that, you know, slaves are just slaves and you know, that's, that's the way it is. But at the same time, there was this growing sense of like, well, slaves should be grateful because we're doing something good for them and they should choose to come back. And there's these fascinating letters where um, slaveholders would write to their former slaves saying, didn't you enjoy working for me? You should come back and I'll give you this great freedom. Right. But of course there's a total disconnect there. And so that tension within where two systems sort of come into a conflict, but are also like undermining and necessitating each other. No, no, you're totally right. And I mean, there's a, there's a question about this in the chat, which mm -hmm. is totally legit, which is yeah. to say, are we not more liberated in modern capitalism than we are in feudalism? The answer is yes, of course. <laughs> what has happened is that in a feudalistic society, mm -hmm. you have total oppression, yeah. basically, right? There's a closed structure of those, of that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And when we repress the structure of domination, mm -hmm. then we enter a bourgeois society in which we treat the relation between things as a relation between people. What that leads to is not, is yes, there is more freedom, mm -hmm. but it is a freedom that comes with alienation. In right. other and words, it's a more constrained freedom. It's a freedom that has the repression mm -hmm. of the underlying hierarchy. Yes. And that comes out in hysteric conversion right and hysteric conversion is exactly what sex in the city is about yeah sex in the city isn't about having sex in the city mm -hmm. and strictly speaking sex in the city isn't about not having sex in the city sex in the city is about hysterically converting different libidinal investments in other words i love shoes because i love me mm -hmm. i love him because i love shoes I love me because I love him, but I love shoes. That's and there's like this breakdown. Mm -hmm. And what's really honest about those movies mm -hmm. to me is that, that we see in a sense, this, you get what happens when you short circuit that. Of course, here comes the end of sex in the city, <laughs> the movie spoilers, which is that Carrie Bradshaw, who's just been jilted by big, mm -hmm. right? Big who has not shown up to the wedding. So they've had like this crisis, the, mm -hmm. the, in most movies, the crisis comes at the two-thirds point of the film. Oh. Here, the crisis comes like at the half point of the film. Third, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, she... real Okay, this is important. Important part of the lecture. Yes. We're, also... We're in the last couple minutes of the movie <laughs> and our lecture. And Carrie Bradshaw realizes that the vacant apartment, mm -hmm. the apartment that was supposed to be the empty space of her, her dream space, yes. is about to be sold. But... She has left or forgotten one pair of shoes in the empty apartment. Yes. And it is said three times over that these are unworn shoes mm -hmm. uh, that are valued at $425. <laughs> Expensive shoes, in other words. Mm -hmm. And in the final seconds of the movie, most romantic movies, right? The final second is that the man or the woman chases after the romantic relationship. It's like they're running down the escalator at the uh, airport yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. In Sex in the City, the final running to save the relationship is she's running to catch the shoe before the house is sold. And of course, as soon as she enters the apartment, who does she find there but big, her romantic interest, mm -hmm. holding her shoe, right? Which is the erotic climax of the movie. Mm -hmm. Big has found attention for mm -hmm. her object of sexual investment, mm -hmm. which is the shoe. Mm -hmm. And she looks at him holding the shoe. He throws away the shoe <laughs> and they passionately make out on the floor. <laughs> and this is, of course, this is the Hitchcockian element of the shoe. Right. 
the shoe itself doesn't mean anything. It and it loses its importance. Yes, yeah. it is mm -hmm. the vessel, and it is the uh, 